Hello and welcome to Asia in Depth. I'm Matt Skiavenza. The Korean American novelist Min Jin Lee has emerged as one of America's most acclaimed storytellers, one whose books have explored the Korean immigrant experience across different locations and generations. Her 2017 novel Pachinko, which tells the story of a Korean family that migrates to Japan, was a finalist for the National Book Award for Fiction. It received an enthusiastic recommendation from former U.S. President Barack Obama, who called it a powerful story about resilience and compassion. If there is ever a time for resilience and compassion, it's now, as the world struggles to combat the coronavirus. In this wide-ranging conversation with Asia Society Executive Vice President Tom Nagorski, Lee reflects on the damage that the virus has wrought on Elmhurst, the New York City neighborhood where the author spent much of her childhood. She also talks about how the shutdown has influenced her creative process, the importance of art in a time of crisis, and fighting the scourge of anti-Asian racism. Lee began the conversation by eulogizing her uncle, who died in the last month. And I had just seen him actually in March, but then we couldn't see him in April because you couldn't visit his nursing home. He was in his 80s. And he's my favorite uncle because he was really funny and sweet. And he's the one who invited us to America. So if Uncle John hadn't invited us to America through chain migration, then I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I wouldn't have done anything. And he was a foreign student who had gotten a scholarship uh, to study history, actually, in Missouri. And when he was here in the late 50s, and he graduated in 1962 from central Missouri State, um, it was a time when he couldn't actually go to the bathrooms because the bathrooms are black or white and he was Asian. So he actually couldn't even go to either place in public places. And I remember hearing stories like that and he ended up coming to New York and I think this is sort of interesting. It's a very New York story. He couldn't figure out what to do because he didn't have money to continue his study. So he went to the New York Public Library and then he looked for a job. And he looked under the classified to figure out what's the most high paying job that I can do. And he looked, noticed that software programmers back then in the early 1960s made good money. So he taught himself how to be a computer software programmer, even though he studied history. Wow. And then he worked at IBM. And that's how we were sponsored. Wow, 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 wow. So he's really the reason that brought you here. And yeah. I assume whether COVID or not, um, the toughest thing these days in a moment of loss like that is you can't be together, right? I mean, right, you can't, you can't honor a person like that. So in a way, when I speak his name, John Kim, in a way, I, I want to honor that. I want to honor yeah. his memory. Yeah. Um, now, when we spoke the other day, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the monotony, the stress, the, the sort of craziness and the weirdness of the situation for all of us, no matter what we do. You said something I thought was interesting. You said, well, I'm busier uh, than I was before. And given uh, the, the, the demands on your time normally, because you speak a lot, you teach a lot, um, how is it that uh, uh, there you are uh, in Harlem uh, and, and, and we all have restrictions on our, on our movements and our socializing? Explain how that is that you're busier than you were before. Well, I think it's my fault because I take on too, much, too many things. I'm supposed to learn how to say no more often, but it's really hard. Also, because of the downturn in the economy, there are so many nonprofit institutions that are really suffering. So I get, I get appeals all the time. And also, there's so many writers who aren't getting the attention that they deserve. So then in a way, like you have this other task of being a good citizen. And I think that takes up a lot of time. And then once I say yes, I take it awfully seriously and then it becomes another job. And I think it's very important when I can exercise whatever little power that I have in my little universe and to say, this is something that's worth doing. So I just wrote an editorial that came out today and I felt like I really wanted to say something about the fact that I'm really, I feel so powerless and angry and and upset about the way people who are considered essential workers are being treated the way they are. So I thought, okay, how do I write this, but in a way that's not didactic. Mm -hmm. So I remember like I spent way too much time working on that essay 
but I'm glad I finished it. But that's like another example of that's not what I'm supposed to be doing, but I want to do it well. So then it ends up becoming more cuckoo. But it's, it's all my fault. I mean, my therapist has made this very clear. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, <laughs> before, before you beat yourself up about it, I read the piece you're referring to this morning. It, oh, it's, thank you. it's on the New York Times uh, website, if you've not seen it, and I think it'll be in print in a couple of days. And it's a very interesting essay about, um, uh, about uh, the, I guess, the, uh, the person who you come in contact with, with your masks on, uh, when you go to buy uh, uh, Korean noodles somewhere down in the, in the, in the 30s in Manhattan, and just the, the importance of really making a, a, a human connection with people who, I guess, among your points was, you know, they're as much, you know, quite frontline workers the way healthcare workers are, but, um, uh, you know, people who, who we must never and certainly not now take for granted, right? Yeah. And also, I, I really love that so much about the texture of New York is that in New York, we have constant contact. Like, I always think when you're riding the subway, it's amazing how we don't have war. If you think about how many countries are in a subway car, right? You always have a gathering of 50 people in a subway car. And then if you think about the Palestinians and the Israelis and the Moroccans and the Pakistanis and the Indians and the Koreans, like there's so many people who might have had historic animosities and yet we sit there and we're going like, when's it, when's, why isn't the subway you know, getting moving faster? And I think we have that sort of shared, we're working together to just get to the next stop, <laughs> which I think is kind of wonderful about New York. And I think, oh, I miss that so much. Oh, I miss it too. I miss it too. I actually, yeah. I mean, this isn't about me, but you're absolutely right. That sort of United Nations of New York that we have uh, and, and public transportation is a part of it. But back to your, your, uh, your being busier than you were. Um, I was reminded, we, we, this, uh, this little fact that I'm not even sure it is a fact because everything about William Shakespeare is, uh, uh, is shrouded in a kind of mystery, but it, this gets thrown into a lot of articles about art and creativity in this time that uh, there was a quarantine for the plague, I think, in the summer of 1606, mm -hmm. uh, right. during which William Shakespeare uh, produced King Lear. Yeah. So not, not to put too much pressure <laughs> on but, but you did tell us the other day that you're working on both a memoir and a novel. And I wonder, those of us who have read these two great books and are, you know, hungry for more Min Jin Lee, uh, can you can you share beyond uh, what you've written for the New York Times recently uh, a little bit about either the novel or the memoir uh, um, uh, that's coming? And and is this time uh, a moment busy as you are uh, where those things advance or they get put on the back burner or something in between? Well, well, thank you for asking. I always feel sort of embarrassed talking about my work, but because I'm so slow. And then I, I work in a really dumb way where I do too much research. So, for example, the other thing that I'm doing right, right this minute is I'm writing the introduction for Penguin Classics, The Great Gatsby. And again, I'm only supposed to write like 1,500 words or 3,000 words. But of course, why did I buy 18 books on Gatsby and I have read all of his letters? And just yesterday I was weeping because I was reading his essays, The Crack Up, which were which were published in Esquire, I can't remember when, I think 1936, where he becomes kind of a, it's a coming of age of his becoming a cynic. And I was getting so immersed in it. And of course it has nothing to do with the essay that I'm going to write. And of course I'm also writing these two big books. But in a way I've noticed that everything that I do, it seems to always be fed into my bigger works because I try really hard to be much more panoramic in the way I look at things. and. Um, I try really, really hard to pay attention to a sense of what artists have been trying to do throughout time. And F. Scott Fitzgerald is a really good example of somebody who, a Princetonian like you. <laughs> Although, did you know that he failed almost everything and he was a dropout? Oh, yeah. 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 He failed everything. This, this side, I think this side of paradise was his last right. hurrah with Princeton, right? I mean, yes, exactly. So that's his first book and he only got it published because he wanted to marry... Zelda and Zelda essentially said, you know, I can't marry you if you're a loser and you don't have a book. So he's like, oh, I guess I better write a book. <laughs> <laughs> and back then, and it was a wild success. And of course he led a life of dissipation, but 
just learning that kind of information is incredibly helpful for me, even though I couldn't be more different than F. Scott Fitzgerald. And yet I find it really absorbing. And because my emotional state has been so parabolic in this sheltering in place period, I find that my work really saves me. I do mm-hmm. tend to retreat from my, emo- the, from my personal relationships, the more upset that I get because I don't like, I don't know how to explain when I feel sad. I don't necessarily always feel entitled to say that I'm sad or I'm upset and I can't always pinpoint to as to why. So then I end up trying to work more. So I find that in my work, that's where I really feel safe. Mm -hmm. And what is it, this may be a very superficial question, so forgive me, but um, one doesn't hear often of of writers and authors who are working simultaneously on a memoir and a novel. But is it, I mean, do you get just in a mood for one or or on the other, or how how does that work? I mean, uh, and, and is it working now for you? I've never done it before. And also I try not to tell myself that it's a memoir because that sounds awfully grandiose and silly. (laughs) I'm I'm 51 years old, so I guess it's possible. I often don't think of my story as that, um, like I haven't slayed any dragons or anything. And yet I was asked to write this and I kind of think of it as a true story and it's called Name Recognition. And it's really a political memoir of how I learned how to talk. Because when I was growing up, I didn't really talk hardly at all. It took me a really long time to be able to even have this conversation. And I took a lot of classes. Do you find yourself more distracted during the quarantine period or more productive? I think initially I was really distracted. I couldn't work at all for the first month. All I could do is hang on the word of every you know, sentence and every thought of Mario Cuomo kind of telling us, you know, this is what's going to happen. And I did find it very distracting because I'm, this is going to sound really strange, but when you're writing novels, I'm, you're kind of thinking of like all 50, 60 chapters. Yep. I mean, for me, I, I think of it like in a big cosmos, but I'm always taking in these weird, bizarre, chaotic facts and trying to take the chaos into cosmos. So in a way, one of the bizarre things that I do very well, and I'm going to sound so strange, is I'm very good at predicting. Mm -hmm. If you tell me a little bit about somebody, I'll be like, oh, she's gonna do that. And then you're gonna come back and say, that's weird, man, how did you figure that out? And I'm going, well, that's all I do. I just study random facts about people and try to predict behavior. So one of the horrible things is that you feel like a Cassandra when you think about the situation because you're like, oh, and because I remember when it first started to happen, I said, oh my gosh, the unemployment is going to be like, I I don't think we can be able to handle all this. And then I kept on looking for confirmation of my prediction. And of course, unfortunately, that turned out to be correct. And and I knew, I knew that it would be the poorest people who would be hurt the most. And today, of course, I learned that of people who earn $40,000 a year, what is it? Over 40% of those people have lost their positions. Right. And if you are making $40,000 a year, which is not a bad salary, it's not an easy salary. Yeah. And even if you went to the grocery store, I mean, certainly in Manhattan, if you made $40,000 a year and you went to the grocery store in Manhattan on a weekly basis and you were trying to feed yourself and pay rent, it would be a slightly stri- stressful experience for you. Yeah. Like you wouldn't think like lamb chops or ground beef, like that right, would be- Right, no, no, a, a, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're seeing that all over the city now uh, and, 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 you know, around the country as well. Do you, just one more question about the novel though. Um, is it, first of all, curious, our audience may want to know, I'm sure they do want to know what it's about. And then is it a, um, because it's fiction, uh, is that a bit of a refuge uh, in this moment? Or, uh, um, you know, I mean, Certainly those of us who read fiction, uh, it's, it, that's a refuge. Is the writing of the fiction uh, a bit of, a, of a, a, you know, an escape as well? I think for me, fiction has always been a place where I find order and peace, especially the word order, because I'm so anxious. I'm such an anxious person, and, and it takes all of my effort to not seem so anxious. <laughs> but my heart is always kind of like, how do I handle all the things that I'm feeling? And then what ends up happening, 
now you're going to end up thinking I'm kind of slightly insane and I probably am. But, and I take all these tremors and I think, okay, well, how do I unify it? How do I put order into it? So writing the fiction is a way for me to take the authorial stance of the chaos. Mm -hmm. And so I do feel an enormous sense of control, but that said, you know, you're a writer. <laughs> you take this blank page and from nothing you have to make something. Right. Right. And I think when I think of it that way, I think, oh, can I do that again? Can I keep making something mm -hmm. out of nothing? And then you realize like, oh, no, actually, it's all around us. It's kind of like yeast particles. It's, it's everywhere. <laughs> I just have to pull it in and then oh. bake bread. Well, you do, you, you do wonderful things with, you, you make great bread, let's just say that. Um, Min, you, uh, uh, well, just so our audience knows, and by the way, it is 10 minutes to 7 here in, uh, in, on the East Coast. I say that not because, uh, to, to give a sense of where we are in the program here, but because a fair warning, Min and I had a conversation about whether we should leave our windows a, a little bit ajar uh, those of you who, who live in this city and in other parts of the country know that seven o'clock, uh, something wonderful happens in the community. And I, so fair warning, there will be some, probably some hooting and hollering and banging of pots and whatever else to celebrate the, the frontline healthcare workers uh, here in Brooklyn where I am and perhaps in Harlem where, where Min Jin Lee is. Um, but I was gonna go next to another part of this city. So Min, you grew up in Elmhurst in Queens. Mm -hmm. um, your parents ran a, a jewelry store in Manhattan, but you went to, went to school in Queens, uh, grew up in Queens, and um, uh, I, I can't help but note that Elmhurst has been hit particularly hard, even in this city that uh, overall has been hit very hard. Um, and Elmhurst General Hospital, uh, you know, it, it, I think it has ebbed a little bit now, but had, had really apocalyptic conditions. So um, I gather you've not been there uh, since just prior to uh, to the outbreak, but what's that like for you, um, you know, to see uh, and to read about and to hear about, um, given that it's, uh, it, it, it's the place you grew up in? Yeah, it fills me with heartbreak. I mean, I'm devastated. And my entire first novel was based on my love of Elmhurst, Queens, and the people who leave Queens who go to Manhattan and what Manhattan means for people who are from Elmhurst, Queens. Like all among us in New York City, there are people in Elmhurst who are working, who are on those trains, who are delivering packages, stocking warehouses, and they are working immigrants. So if you go to Elmhurst right today, you'll notice that the streets um, have businesses that they don't have for, you know, store for rent signs, for example, because they're all actually operating. However, they're all essential stores. And you'll see uh, immigrants mostly from um, Central America, uh, uh, Latin American countries, as well as um, most Asian countries. And these are working families, very blue collar. And it's a very vital community in any way. It's not depressed. It's not a depressed, broken community. Every unit is contained with people and tenants. So the reason why Elmhurst Hospital is in that apocalyptic state and because he didn't get the resources and why it's so important to draw attention to it is because it's a public hospital. And as you know, America, we have this healthcare system where you have private hospitals and public hospitals. And of course, public hospitals get less attention, but the people who use public hospitals are not any less important. As a matter of fact, right now they're considered essential. So I find that deeply upsetting. Um, and I'm angry. I'm angry about that. I am. Yep. When we first spoke, uh, Min, several weeks ago, uh, not first spoke, but when we spoke about this event and the need to uh, shift it to um, the online platform, um, you mentioned something else that now has become a, a very profound uh, issue around the country that ha is not technically a public health issue, but you mentioned the acts of racism against Asian and Asian Americans. Um, we've, uh, at the Asia Society, obviously it's a big, big issue for us. Um, not long ago, we were holding events where we were celebrating, uh, what seemed like the long overdue recognition, uh, and celebration of, uh, of Asians in this country across so many, um, uh, lines of work. And, 
and here we are uh, seeing something that really seems like it should be a, a part of ancient history. First of all, I wonder how have you or, or have you uh, experienced uh, firsthand um, any of this kind of uh, uh, xenophobia or racism, or is it just something that you, you've read about uh, like many of us? Oh, I've experienced racism all my life. Yeah. I mean, all my life. And if you're in social media, you always experience it if you're a woman of color, I think, especially if you have any sort of progressive agenda. And I do. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then, of course, when I'm walking outside, I'm afraid because they are being physically violent against Asian women. So what you're seeing is not, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's so, it's very unseemly, the idea that men would hit women, but a lot of men have hit women. And there have been over 1,500 instances that are reported, reported acts of violence against Asian Americans just, just within the past few months. And I don't know what other people's experiences have been as Asian Americans, like very often you'll ask an Asian person or an Asian American person, have you experienced racism? And they'll always say things like, well, no, you know, not to me, blah, blah, blah. And I always kind of think that's amazing. But I think right now, I don't know a single person of Asian ethnicity who's not sensitive to the fact that they could be targeted, either mm -hmm. muscular or physical violence, or you certainly shouldn't travel by yourself at night. I mean, I'm really aware of this right now. And again, I, I speak about it only because I, I don't see the alternative. Like, if I make nice, like, what's the benefit for me that I make other people feel comfortable, but then expose myself and the people that I love to more harm? So I can't afford to not mention it. But yeah. it's not pleasant. I mean, who wants to hear that? Who wants to hear that people are being horrible? We actually had, um, again, on this platform about 10 days ago, Van Jones from uh, CNN. It's, uh, African American sure. uh, and well known commentator, and he said some, a couple of things that were very interesting. First of all, he said that he felt a burden, uh, uh, maybe not a burden, but he thought it was as important, if not more important, uh, for people of color who were not Asian, Asian Americans, and for white Americans to, uh, to, to, to stand against um, this sort of other. Uh, byproduct of the COVID outbreak, um, and, and he he said uh, he said some very powerful things about you know we will not to to my Asian American friends I'm paraphrasing here we will not let you down, and I thought that was a very um, uh, and of course coming from a community that knows a thing or two about uh, uh, about this issue so um, um, it's just I, I, I do you, it sounds from your first answer that. Uh, that this that you, you do view this as a profound thing again at the Asia Society we felt we were hearing and and perhaps whether it was Hollywood or the business community or or or, or American politics on the cusp of a better moment in terms of representation and recognition and I wonder do you think that um, how, how much do you think what's happened in the last few months in the wake of what some people, including our president for a while, were calling the China virus, how much do you think this is a setback in a profound way or a blip? Well, as I said earlier, I practice a little bit of futurism, and I yep. actually think that it'll get worse for the next couple of years because I don't think this, unfortunately, and, and even after the vaccine, has been created and assuming that we can all get out there the incredible economic and personal and psychological devastation that we have wrought from this virus has to find um, a villain and i think that unfortunately if people keep attributing this to some sort of wet market in china people will think uh, constantly conflating a government or a country with the people and yep. unfortunately, this face is considered foreign in the United States. It's always considered foreign. It hasn't, they haven't really changed that. And I think Hollywood has done a deplorable job, deplorable in terms of representation of Asian Americans and, Asian, and people of Asian ethnicities. And that's on them. I mean, I'm doing whatever I can to try to fix things, mm -hmm. but you got to call, <laughs> got to call it like you see it. And yeah. until 
we, all of us institutions, and I'm, and I'm gratified by what you said, Van Jones has said, because if we don't have allies strongly speaking out against these issues, then things are never going to change. Right. If things don't change, then the thing that I see as a frontline person at Amherst College, where I teach, is we are doing a horrible thing to the next generation. I see Asian American kids who really suffer a sense of inferiority because they are considered less than the majority. And that's weird. Like they're born in this country and they are sometimes, you know, working class, middle class or affluent, but they all seem to share this idea that somehow their physical envelope is unacceptable. So they have actually internalized the absence of representation into a kind of ghostly presence. And that's really disturbing. We're going to take a short break and talk about two upcoming web-only programs here at Asia Society that couldn't be more different. On Tuesday, May 26th, the award-winning chef Lucas Sin will teach viewers how to make one of China's most famous and delicious dishes, mapo tofu. And the following Tuesday, June 2nd, Asia Society Policy Institute President Kevin Rudd will speak with the acclaimed author and journalist Fareed Sakaria about the future of democracy under COVID-19. To learn more about all upcoming Asia Society programs, please check out asiasociety.org slash online. And now let's get back to Min Jin Lee and Tom Nagorski. So the cheers are starting at least outside my window. <laughs> yes. It's a little subdued tonight. Maybe on day 60, it's... Uh... Anyway, I have no idea whether you can hear it, but here's here's to those folks. Can in, you hear uh, mine? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I think you've got are, you've, you've got some pot bangers there. And yeah, the, there's a lot of pot banging here. The windows are almost all closed, and you can still hear it. If I had the windows open, it would be like there's a din. Yeah. Uh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. It but. is. It is. It is. That's the reason I kept my window open. Listen. Um, I want to first of all I'm going to come in a moment to questions because as I said they're they're piling up and they're and they're they're really interesting ones. Fair warning, a lot of people want to know about your next novel. Okay. But, um, <laughs> oh right, I haven't. I dodged that, didn't I? <laughs> but but I, I I mentioned um, a moment ago that uh, we are in Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. We always at the Asia Society mark this in many ways. Of course, usually in person. Um, but uh, in preparation for this event, I was reminded we had a few days ago. Um, on this platform, we had some of the producers of the uh, landmark series that PBS is doing that just started running um, the other night uh, called Asian Americans. It's a, it's a big, sweeping five-part history uh, right. of the Asian uh, experience in this country. I had a chance to look at um, a little sneak preview of the episode and, and, and speak uh, with, these, uh, uh, with the, the, a couple of the people who produce it. And I was struck by how many... Um, references there were to uh, people who, um, Asians who are uh, living now uh, and, and experiencing some degree of success, and, and the people who they feel blaze a trail for them, whether in business or the arts or politics. And um, just thinking ahead to this uh, conversation, I wonder, are there people who you feel uh, whether they're Korean or not, um, who ha- you, you look at as, uh, as having had that role for you, of having been sort of trailblazers for, for the success that you've enjoyed? Oh, sure. Oh, so many. I mean, in terms of the Korean Americans I can think of, I think Young Hill Kong is a really great example. Uh, he was actually edited by Maxwell Perkins, who edited F. Scott Fitzgerald. I mean, wow. right? So it's that, it's that, you can go far, uh, you can that go back that far. And then you also have people like Run Young Kim, who wrote Clay Walls, a terrific knockout historical novel that was published in the 80s. And in between, even people like Maxine Hong Kingston, Chinese American, you know, Woman Warrior, a fantastic book. And there, nowadays, it would take me a really long time to list all the Korean Americans who've been publishing since then and are publishing now. But I also feel like I've taken an enormous amount of. Um, cues from 19th century novels from Europe as well as the U.S. and from African-American novelists because that's when I really started to see what it's like in America to write as an outsider. And I was very influenced by Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Alice Walker, 
they've been very important influences for me. They continue to be influences for me. Um, more generally, while we're talking about influences and in artists, and this is a grand question, and so feel free to uh, uh, just to dodge <laughs> or, or, or say whatever you want. But um, th and, and this event is actually we we, uh, we titled it "Art in the Time of Coronavirus," right? Uh, and we're talking to other people um, under the same banner, but what? what what do you think the role is uh, of, of the artist in a moment like this? Um, you know, it's obviously true that art and literature sometimes uh, arise from a moment of trauma or difficulty uh, or even thrive. And um, do you feel that? Do you have any sense of how this moment may, uh, may impact your work one way or the other? I think it is incumbent on us to make art. I do. I don't think it's a luxury. I think that we need it like we need water. I mean, I certainly do. And I think there are, are other people who feel this way. I think art has become a very expansive definition of what sort of falls into that category. And the novel has been around us for quite a long time. And so has nonfiction. Um, I'm a very political person. I like it. It's what keeps me on on the narrow, on the straight and narrow. That said, I don't think most people want to read politics in a straight form. So I'm constantly thinking about, well, what's my really good looking Trojan horse? And for me, my good looking Trojan horse is oh, come along and take in this message that I want to say. But there are people who say as novelists, oh, I write, write based on emotion or image. I write very much, very, very much on this idea that I have, a, I have something to say. And this is what I really want you to listen to. And how do I get you to hang out with me for 14, 16 hours? That is not an easy thing. Like, if you really think about the novels that you read that are five or 600 pages long and you actually stay with it, and I, I understand that people don't want to, whenever I do feel the sense of completion um, I always think like, oh, I really wanted to listen to her. I really wanted to listen to him. I wanted to be in their world. I wanted to mm -hmm. be in a world where they have that sense of order. And I think it's because I feel so much disorder that I feel more compelled to create order. And right now, you and I feel probably more disordered, more chaotic than we've ever felt in our lives. Right, right. Okay. So we'll get to some specific questions, but there is this general one that several people watching are asking, and, you know, have at it. What's your next novel? What's it, <laughs> what's it about? And when can they read it? Right. Um, that's the, the, la the last part is the hardest. Um, it's called American Hogwan, H-A-G-W-O-N. So right. if you're a fan, you know exactly what that is because it's part of your life. A hog one is a tutoring center. It's a private tutoring center. The equivalent is like the Princeton Review or Stanley Kaplan or anything where you get sort of enhanced education for money. And I'm writing it about the value of education for Koreans around the world. It is a novel. I've been working on it for quite some time. It's due in almost two years to my publisher, but it might take a little longer. I hope my publisher is not watching. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> My problem is that I rewrite so much. Like, I'll write something and I'll just go, ah, that didn't work. And I'll just toss it. And I, I mean, I really have everything that I write is uh, 20 to 30 drafts. So, I, I mean, I'm not going to write that many books before I die. I just not, I'm not. So, and this memoir I've been working on for basically 15, 16 years off and on in terms of the sections that go into it because I've been writing nonfiction for a long time. Yeah. Very hard for me to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a good answer. And I hope your publisher is watching. <laughs> um, You're going to okay. write me a note, right, Tom? <laughs> Do you well, please give uh, me an excuse? S. S. Chin, doesn't want to give first name, asks a uh, version of a question I asked you before. What's your work routine right now? Has your creative process changed during the quarantine? Oh, good, good question. Um, I do this thing that I talk about sometimes and it totally freaks people out, but I read about it from Willa Cather. Willa Cather did this thing where she read a chapter of the Bible every day before she started working. I now have read the Bible six times. Like, like as a, if you can think of a, a continuous cycle. 
and I read a chapter and then I start my work. That's pretty much how I work six days a week. And I really like it. How has the pandemic affected my work schedule? Um, I work all the time now. Like I work constantly because I feel so unstable, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not a very attractive answer, but I guess it's really true. No, 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 no. Uh, okay. My I think work is my thread. It's what I hold on to. Um, Jeffrey Tao, self-proclaimed big fan of Pachinko. Thank you, as Jeffrey. we all are. Um, asks about uh, the Korean community in Japan today. And I don't know how much mm -hmm. you still follow this uh, three years after the novel came out. Uh, he asks, are they more united or are there different factions? Um, what, you know, have you still followed them? And, and what can you say about that? Um, they are not more united and they're not more disparate. There's a, they're diminishing. Like that's one of the things that yeah, we have to understand about ethnic communities because you have more assimilation. But what's interesting is that Prime Minister Abe and his administration, they're quite conservative. And they have often done, used the rhetoric of xenophobia for this community that's been there for four or five generations. So apparently the violence and targeted racism against them has actually been an all time high. And I imagine that it will not get easier for them. Like I, I don't in any way think that, think that things are getting better. I don't believe that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a no, shift. I'm really like a fun person to talk to. <laughs> well, no, here's a good one. Okay. Career advice. Sure. This is, uh, anonymous. Uh, I did not I really mention. want to ask a novelist a career advice. Yes. Well, it, <laughs> yes and no. The, um, uh, so I didn't mention in the introduction, I assume many in our audience know that uh, uh, you uh, study the law and you began your career as a lawyer. So we have someone, um, not clear whether they're Korean American or not, it doesn't really matter, but who says that he or she is being pulled by family. Sure. Now it sounds like some characters in, in I guess, the first book you wrote. Right. Um, first novel you wrote, uh, pulled into, uh, you know, into the legal profession. Uh, suggests that he or she should pursue that. Uh, in, in his or her heart seems to want to be a writer. Do you, and asks, do you have any regrets? Uh, I assume not, but do you have any regrets about making the shift that you did when you did it? Oh, you know, I get a version of this letter almost every day. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. I get a lot of letters from very sweet young readers and around the world kind of saying, what should I do? You switched and you became a successful writer. And one of the things that I, I hate to throw cold water at anybody, but I want to because I care about them. When I sell a paperback novel, and you're a writer, so you know, when you sell a hardcover, like my, I think I make like $2.25. And mm -hmm. I think when I sell a paperback, it's like $1.15. So for most, and most people, and I'm a trustee at the Authors Guild, so I could share this. The average author actually lives below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. The average author. The average author does not make their primary income from writing. So whenever I meet young people who want to be writers, they kind of think they're going to have this sort of a lot of time to think and to wait for the muse to light on their shoulders and sort of um, inspire them. And actually, I think that's not very helpful to people. I think you should write if you feel like that's the only thing you want to do. And I think it's very important. I always try to say, find shelter. You have to keep your uh, overhead really low. And mm -hmm. if you must write, you have to have a different expectation of life and acceptance and reception because it's tough out there. Uh, do I regret having quit being a lawyer? Sometimes I have really deeply regretted be having left the law because I've been in situations where my husband has lost his job and we didn't have health care and we had to take care of college tuition. I don't have a very glamorous life. I think people often think that I do. I have five jobs. I speak, I teach, I write books, I do freelance work. And then I'm also doing some things for TV. I also, I do a lot of literary citizen work. It, it just, and I do them because I want to, no one's making me do it. But I think that the hustle of being a 
full-time writer is really quite intense. And I tell my students this because my students are very starry-eyed and they kind of go like, well, why couldn't I write books? And I kind of think you can, but for the most part, you sell maybe a thousand copies of a book for a hardcover if you're lucky. If you're lucky, it's hard to do that because your family can't buy more than 50. <laughs> I've asked. So, I, I, you know, I, I say this and I, and I think you should write because you feel like you have something burning to say. Otherwise, it's just a, it's a nice idea. It's a nice idea yeah. to be a writer. Well, well uh, let me ask you, men, a, a, a kind of a, a different version of that same question. And I don't, I don't know, uh, I probably should know, but your earlier career in the law, mm -hmm. was it the way this questioner suggests uh, for, for him or her, was, did you go into the law thinking at the back of your mind you really wanted to be a writer, or at that point did you really want to be a lawyer? Oh, I didn't know I wanted to be a writer. Like, I wasn't one of those kids who thought, um, one day I'm going to be a writer. Like, this young person who asked this question is significantly more advanced on the path than I was. Like, I thought, so for, this is a true story. I actually drew up a business plan when I was a lawyer of how to quit. And the thing that I was going to do is to open a coffee bar. True oh. story. I even found a location. I even found a space and I was thinking about doing it. I found a partner. I wrote a 25 page proposal on how to become a coffee bar owner. It was called Flossies and it was in Tribeca. So that's how far gone I was in terms of like, oh, there's no way I could ever be a writer because in a way I wasn't uh, dumb about what it would mean. And I, I have approached my life in a very sober way about what it means to be a writer. And I feel sorry for people who don't tell you the truth about that because you know, it's hard to find health insurance in this country. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a, um, I told you the best questions would come from uh, our audience around the globe, and, and I think this is a really good one. Um, it, it's, it's a Pachinko question again, uh, that the female characters uh, in Pachinko, this is certainly true, they are strong and they succeed against overwhelming odds, right? How was your book received uh, by women in Korea? Oh, I think it did very well. It did uh, probably better than respectably in Korea and the, the reviews were outstanding. So I'm very proud of that. But <sighs> but did you did you hear from from women in particular in Korea? Well, I hear from, well, I hear from readers every day. Like, yeah, I, I can't actually respond to my correspondence because it's just me. And I can't get to all those things, but I read every single letter, direct message, you know, tweet, whatever people send me. And it's been so incredibly kind and loving. And I feel like it was right of me to spend the kind of time that I did writing that book. And I think that's probably the greatest consolation that one can spend when you write a novel is, or any kind of book is to feel like, oh, it wasn't a waste of my time. If only you didn't have so much in economic insecurity in this country, and if people want to write books, I kind of think you should do it. But I, the response throughout the world, because it's translated into 30 languages, has been so loving and so kind and good. And I have not had bad experiences with this book, and I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised by it. Well, I'm not. Caroline Kennedy. <laughs> Caroline Kennedy isn't surprised either, and all these other, all these other fans. Um, that is the uh, greatest. <laughs> broader, broader question here. Uh, we talked about Asian Americans and Asian American Heritage Month. Um, uh, a question here that that says, and I think it's it's a fair statement. You're a source of inspiration to younger to a younger generation of Asian Americans. If there is one single piece of advice you would offer to the millennials within the Asian American community, what would that be, especially with respect to bicultural double identity issues? Boy, that's not to put a ton on your shoulders there, but um, yeah, what, 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 what do you say to that community? I think to, and I, and I say this as a person with an agenda, is to really critically think when people allow your absence is to take space, is to be mm -hmm. present, to make people a little uncomfortable, even if 
you're yourself uncomfortable. Like I'm very uncomfortable speaking. I'm very uncomfortable being in public. I would rather be under my desk most of the time. Like, and I do it because I have noticed that there are people like me don't seem to exist. I'm often asked to do things and I don't feel very comfortable doing them, but I feel like, well, if I don't do it, then will they ask somebody else? And if, I, and then I have the sense of pressure. Like if I don't do it well, will somebody like me ever be asked again? So I have this foreign name, you know, Minjin is not like Alice or, you know, Jessica or other pretty American names, Western names. And, you know, people automatically wonder like if I'm a foreigner. So in a way, when I show up and if I speak English well, or if I'm nice or funny or any of those things, or if I'm emotional, people are always like, oh, look at that, a human being. And I kind of think that's why you show up. So when I talk to younger people, I always say, try if you can for the things that are important to show up because it matters and i think that is a double burden i think there's a there is an enormous amount of burden whenever you are a statistical minority in any situation so if you're a trans person if you are a non-binary person like when you show up and you confront the reality that you're not acceptable to the majority it is a bigger burden but i think that i've noticed it's kind of like the subway metaphor if people get to sit next to you and we have to get to the next destination together, they realize that you're not such a weirdo. And that sounds so strange, but I'm always surprised when people say things to me like, oh, I didn't know you're gonna be like you. And I kind of think, what were you expecting? And rather than being offended, I kind of think it's funny to me because when, you know, when I think, oh, this is Tom Nagorski. He's half Norwegian, half Polish. Like, what's he going to be? He lives in Brooklyn. He won eight Emmys. Like, what's he going to be? Is he going to look down at me? Is it, is it going to be an equal conversation? Like, I can't walk around with so many expectations just because of your biography, because you have a biography, but then there's also the essence of who you are. And you can't get to that unless you get to know people. So sometimes I kind of think, even if it's un uncomfortable making, please show up, please stand up for what you believe in because I don't know if other people are going to come in and do it for me. And um, I do believe that we have to keep bending toward justice, but it's like we're, we're doing it. So that's my little piece of advice is to really show up for yourself and for other people and, and for the good things. I always tell my students to be decent. And they always look at me like, this is a writing class. <laughs> Why are you telling me this? I'm like, because it's important. Go and be decent. <laughs> That'll do it for this week's episode of Asia In Depth. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube, and check out all episodes on our show page at asiasociety.org slash podcast. We want to extend warm wishes to all of our listeners to stay safe and healthy during these challenging times. We're all in this together. I'm Matt Schiavenza. See you next time.